Hello, everybody. I'm going to wave at the gifted faker. Most excellent. Let's turn this camera around. Hello, and welcome to All the Fields. I'm Patricia Angelin at Alba Technique. I'm a little agitated um, this Facebook Live Wednesday because I have just most unexpectedly and excellently had a COVID-19 exam at the drugstore that's actually local to me, right around the corner. And um, I had to sit, of course, you know, for 15 minutes to make sure that I didn't have any major problems with it. And now I am here with you. So isn't that a wonderful thing? I have had my jab, as they'd say in Ireland, and my shot, as they say here in the United States. So that is a good thing. And in 28 days, I go back and I get the booster. I was um, fortunate enough to get the Moderna uh, of, of the vaccine. But as with anything new, it has made me just an, a little agitated because my, uh, my routine was upset. So there we are. So what I'm going to do with you now is what I have told you about on um, several different calls in order to self-calm. So I'm calming myself down in your viewing and in your hearing. First of all, I'm gonna pay attention to how I'm actually sitting. And I'm gonna sit on the very edge of this chair so that I can feel feel my myself centered and nice and solidly in the chair I'm sitting in and my feet are firmly soles on the ground about hip width apart yeah that feels good and now I'm going to pay attention to my breathing and as I breathe I'm lifting up my head opening up my chest and my back I'm going to breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth. I'm going to breathe five of those. I invite you to breathe them with me. First three with the eyes closed. In through the nose. Out through the mouth. In through the nose. Out through the mouth. In through the nose. Out through the mouth. I'm going to open my eyes on my horizon line, which will be above camera level, and through the nose. Two more. I feel my body systems calming down. Now they're not fully calm. If I was doing an Alba emoting emotional effector pattern, what I would observe in myself and what I would know is that I needed to do a full step out. If I was working with someone with Alba technique, even I would do a step out so that I would be calmed working with the student. But I'm calm enough and you can hear that my voice has changed a little bit. Just more air going in, the breath is coming in and out a little more deeper in my body, a little more deeply in my body. So this is a good thing, and we can tackle a question that was asked of me about two and a half weeks ago. And because further questions came in from you, I had shelved it until now. Because your questions in all the fields will always take precedence. So if you put something into the chat, I will answer it. And if I don't get it onto one call, I will save it and I will do it the following week on either Facebook or on Instagram. And if you don't have one or the other platform, it's not a problem because it will be on the Alba Technique YouTube page. And if you subscribe to that, you'd be able to easily um, view it whenever you feel like it or a portion of it. And so they're all there. Um, in, assist, in addition, um, there are a couple put on as video blogs on the albatechnique.com website. So if you want to get a sense of that, um, those are some of the opportunities that you would have to do that. So the question that I was asked is, 
It was in a casual conversation, fully masked outside with a stranger. And I cannot recall what the chat was about, but the um, young person said to me, I just have so many narcissists in my life. And I said, how do you know that you are dealing with narcissists? Just interested in how, how he knew. And he said, oh, I don't know. It's just that these are people, all people who are selfish. They're just so blasted selfish. They're always thinking about themselves. And I went, well, they could be egocentric, centered on the I, the ego, and still not be narcissists because that's actually a brain dis and emotional disorder. So um, I don't know. But he said, well, then, you know, what is it? And, um, and how do I know if I actually have somebody who has that in my life? And after I'd stepped back from the anger of that person's reactivity a little bit, I said, that is a really, really good question. And I, um, I go on Facebook Live and on Instagram Live for a program on Wednesdays at 5 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time in the United States for a half hour. And I'm going to think about that as a lay person, you know, as a person who is just a normal, intelligent person. How do I know? if I'm dealing with a narcissist, as a colleague, as a friend, as a sibling, as a parent, as an aunt or uncle, how do I know? And that's a really good question because golly, it seems that there are so many of them now, doesn't it? So many narcissists in our midst. Now, at first I'm gonna tell you what it definitely isn't. And this comes from um, the wonderful ALBA teacher um, at ALBA Technique, uh, Mr. Ron Burton, who is currently um, living a life in art and giving a great deal in the great state of Oklahoma, um, as well as um, as a director in, in certain ways, you know, in different parts of the world. And um, he asked me when he was very early in his training with ALBA Technique, he said, Pat, I'm really worried about something. And I said, okay, Ron, you know, shoot, what is it? And he said, well, does this work with you where you're thinking so much about yourself and you're observing yourself and you're observing your own body? Well, this made me into a narcissist. And I went, golly, no. But wait a minute, let me think about that because it's an excellent question, it's a real one. Will working hard on yourself to know thyself and to change and grow as a human being into your humanity more and more, does that process make you narcissistic? And I am here to tell you absolutely not. And why do I know that? Because that's one of the very things that a narcissist isn't gonna do. There's, there's absolutely nothing that the rest of us can do to get them to do something like that. They're not going to come to Alba Technique. They're not going to go and, and probably and get any help at all because as far as they're concerned, they're fine. The problems are with everybody else who just don't do what they tell them to do because they're the ones that know how things are supposed to be. And they know that they're the ones who are supposed to be at the center of everything. And what matters is how they feel and what they do and how they solve the problem and how they communicate. And obviously, you know, isn't that the way it is? Of course it is. Everyone knows that. Everyone knows that I'm right. If they think about it and if they're intelligent, they're going to follow me. <sighs> obviously, there's problems with that as we know. So, um, yeah, um, narcissism. It comes from, it's a psychiatric designation, and it comes from the Greek myth of Narcissus. And you can look that up easily. Look up the myth of Narcissus on Google and on Wikipedia and read about the more complicated parts of it. But in essence, Narcissus was a particularly beautiful young man. He was aesthetically, he was physically beautiful, he was intelligent, he was everything a young Greek male human being was supposed to be, and he knew it. And one day, walking through a wooded area, he happened upon a beautiful still pond. And this pond, the water was not moving. 
and he bent down to get a drink. But before he got a drink, Narcissus beheld himself reflected back in the still water of the pond as in a mirror. And he became completely enraptured with himself and with his own beauty and his own perfection. And he continued to contemplate his own image as though he was relating to someone else, but he was relating only to his own image. And he looked neither to the right nor to the left nor up nor down, he looked at his image and he was looking so intently that he didn't even do what he had intended to do when he knelt down, which was to take a drink of water. And Narcissus died of thirst, contemplating his own perfections in the stream. And that, men and women, girls and boys, is a narcissist from the Greek myth of Narcissus. Now, practically speaking, how does this play out in life? Well, I asked my very brilliant father, physician father, when I was about 16 years old, I was contemplating what this is, what this isn't. I know, a 16 year old, why, who knows? I just did things like that. And I said, Dad, can you answer a question for me or ask Dr. Gornstein, you know, um, what it would be? And he says, well, no, you don't ask Dr. Gornstein. You, and I didn't know he was ill at the time. So you can ask me, what's your question? And he just said, well, what is a narcissist, Dad? What, what is that? What does a narcissist do? He said, ah, well, daughter, I will tell you a story. So just like many of the great sages, he basically told me a parable. It was just the one that had just happened. He said, this happened to your second cousin once removed last week. And then he said, you remember Beanie? And I said, yeah, yeah, I remember Beanie. He says, yes. Well, his mother, as you know, is in, um, is in care. She's in a nursing home and she, her, she's absolutely fine. She's in excellent health. And he goes and visits her every day. He or one of his siblings goes and visits their mom every day. And um, last week, the mother's sister died out in California. And this young um, young man went to, was really afraid to tell his mother that his aunt had died overnight because his mother was particularly close to her sister out in California. And everybody thought that this friendship was so deep and it was what really what sisters need to be. And so he thought, oh golly, you know, what if I give mother a heart attack by telling her this? What if I, oh well, you know, she's got to know and I've been the one who's been deputed to actually tell mom that her sister has died. So he goes to the nursing home, he goes in, knocks on the door, comes in, he said, hi mom, and he'll say, hello dear. And he says to her, mom, I'd like you to go over and sit down in the chair because I've got some news and it's not good news and I think you ought to be sitting down for this. You know, the classic things, are you sitting down? And so she said, oh, I don't need to sit down, you know, to tell me what to do. He said, well, mom, please, please just sit down. You know, um, um, it's bad news, mom. And so she goes, she goes, oh, all right. She goes and she sits down. And he said, mom, I am so sorry to have to tell you that Auntie Rosalie died in California last night in the middle of the night. And his mother's response, without missing a beat, was, Well, I had a bad night, too. <laughs> Her sister died in the night, and she'd had a bad night, too. And so my father said, And that daughter is a narcissist. And I said, But Dad... How could she be a narcissist? She's a mother of a lot of children and she's raised all of these. She's raised, what is it, it's six kids, right? And, you know, and has a marriage and her, her husband never left her and, and her kids all grew up and they've all got great senses of humor. Oh my gosh, they can find humor in anything. He says, yeah, and with a mother like that, they've needed it. He says that was their defense mechanism. Each and every one of them developed a fabulous sense of humor to cope with a mother who was a narcissist. 
because everything was about her. He said, that daughter is narcissism, and off my father goes. And so I put that in my little pipe and smoked it, as it were, and um, and have over the years, you know, had that awareness of, okay, narcissism is a particular type of a person who puts themselves first before anybody else in response to any situation whatsoever. And that is kind of a good working definition. So the next question is, is what are some strategies that you can use? Because obviously you don't want to run around diagnosing um, friends and family as being narcissists if they're just a bit neurotically self-involved, you know? Um, but one of the ways I have found over my now many years of, of observing people is that without being, quote, judgmental, because I am probably one of, if not the least judgmental person in the sense that that word is used um, around, because I just, I accept people kind of where they're at. However, for those of you who are, he are hearing, I better watch the time here. For those of you who are, are listening here, um, it really is difficult to tell. And sometimes it takes time because narcissists do not only come in one variety. They're not only loud, bombastic, look at me's, 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 boop da boop da boop da No. Some narcissists are very, very quiet. For some of them, their strategy is to look like the person who just cares more than anybody else. Look what I do for this person. Look what I do for that person. Look what I do for that person. Look what I've done for you over and over and over again. I am just so self-sacrificing. So that's another type of person who might be a narcissist. But the only way you can tell usually is over time. And um, if your own core self-esteem is healthy and you are not an enabler of people with varying neuroses, or which means you have proper internal boundaries, you're fine dealing with narcissists. And then there are people who are not particularly sensitive too. They're usually fine, pretty fine dealing with narcissists because they're not emotionally sensitive. I've heard this talked about in regards to empathy and empaths. Now, as, as empaths are particularly susceptible to falling into relationships with narcissistic um, disorder individuals. And, um, you know, people who have a tendency to, um, to self-efface, people who have a tendency not to want to have conflict, I would certainly be that way. Oh boy, I detest conflict. You know, I'm not one of those people who just really likes to have a good fight or a nice, you know, mm, discussion about something or let's argue it out. You know, I wouldn't be one of those people. Um, thank goodness we have many people who are because it's, it's an excellent way of being. Um, but the, the narcissist can be very, very stealth about it. Or the narcissist can be like a family member of mine who has now gone to God, you know, says, don't speak ill of the dead. But I'm not speaking ill of the dead. I am making observations that took me many, 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 many years because this person, this, this, this uncle, you know, is in the next generation from me. And I didn't really ever get that he was, did have this particular narcissistic disorder until I was, again, with my father. It's a story with my father. I was sitting and having what he calls a toddy. I was having a drink with my dad. Cheers. This is water, not a cocktail. And, um, and my uncle came over for a toddy with us. And so, you know, I, I got him his toddy. I brought it to him and he and dad were in an excellent conversation. And, um, and they were in conversation about something that I actually knew something about. And so I sat down with my drink and um, he had asked a question of my dad and I was able to answer it. And I answered it. And my dear and wonderful uncle, whom I adored, looked at me and he looked at me like this. And he came down on his haunches and he's like this. And he's listening. And he's listening. And he's listening. And when I finished what I was going to say, rather than responding to what I had just said, he sat back, 
turned to my father and picked up where he had left off. I was astounded. This was my beloved uncle. He hadn't heard a word I said. He appeared, he was looking at me. He appeared to be listening to me, but he was not in fact listening to me at all. Not one word did he hear. And I went back and I went like that. And I looked at my father who was in conversation with my uncle, looking at my uncle and he glanced at me and he went, and went back to my uncle. My uncle didn't even register that because it was toward me and not about him. And you know, the conversation went on and it was perfectly lovely and I appeared to be taking part because my father was a brilliant listener and actually valued. And at first I thought it was with, just because I was a woman and I thought there was a, a misogynistic tendency that I had not realized. And so after, after uncle left, I went to my father, Dad, what was that about? And he sighed and he said, well, that is my brother. And I said, yeah, but does he do this only with women? He said, well, he does do this with women. I've been watching it for many years. He does it with women, but not only with women. He's not a misogynist, that's not it. My brother is a narcissist, daughter. And, I, and he said, and I've often wondered how his wife stood it. I said, he does this to his wife, what he just did to me back then? He said, oh, with great regularity. Your mother and I have often remarked upon it and wondered how they could possibly sustain a marriage. But they have. So he was very accepting. So I think for those of us who are, you know, dealing with real life, you know, and who are not the psychiatrists and psychologists, we have to watch the behavior of the people. So it took me many years to realize that I had a close family member whom I did love, who was never doing me any harm, obviously. This was not a toxic kind of a thing. Um, so as a young person, I would never have had occasion, you know, to know any of this. But it's only once I had joined the adult group and was having adult conversations and that I realized gradually that it wasn't a factor of my youth. It wasn't a factor I was the next generation. It wasn't only a factor I was a woman. The, I had to wait for the evidence to come in. So that is something that I would say to you. You got to wait for the evidence to come in. And when it's someone whom you cannot just go on your merry way and let this person fade out of your life. And I do tell you that if you suspect that the person is so egocentric, that is, it is not a mere ne small neuroses, a mere flaw, um, and the person is growing in other ways and just gradually does change a bit over the years in ways that are good, then you're probably not dealing with a real narcissist, but you might be. And for that, it's gonna take months and maybe years for all the evidence to come in, as I now say. In the case of another family member, and I will be more circumspect about this because the family member is living, um, it, has it took me probably a quarter century to realize that this family member is not just mildly neurotic, but actually has, you know, some disorders. And since I am not a psychiatrist, I am absolutely not diagnosing any disorders, but they're, they're disorders of the brain at this point in history, in this particular individual. And that means since this is a close family member that I do have to deal with it. Now, many people say, you know, I close the iron door. I dust my feet off from this person. Well, you know, is that healthy for you? Is that healthy for the other members of your family for you to do that? Well, if it's extreme enough and you're the target, might be, might be. But you sit back and you observe. You observe yourself and your reactivity to the, under, the other individual. 
Are you, we all know what enabling is now because of all the talk about addictions and, 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 and people who are, al, uh, you know, who are members of Al-Anon but never addicted to themse themselves. And if you've had a parent um, or a powerful person in your life who say is an alcoholic or has any other addiction, then you have had to deal with some of these things and you have developed certain most excellent um, body limbic emotional techniques to you know to deal with this stuff so you got to watch the other person you've got to watch yourself um maybe if no other uh if no other uh, questions come in about this for more specificity um i will continue to develop this next week but to go back to you have to go by their observed behavior and that's what you observe of that person's behavior not what they tell you they're doing or have done or what you should do or what you haven't done. No, 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 no. You need to, to be able to emotionally disengage just enough that you have a clarity of sight and sound of what is the behavior of this individual actually. Are there any lies that they tell and appear to have no consciousness whatsoever that they have just lied about something that you happen to know never happened or happened years ago and why are they hanging on to that? It's a small teeny little thing or yeah, you remember that something like that happened but what has just been thrown at you or the person, other person in the room, bears no resemblance to the reality of that event. Wow. If any of those things, and that's why I say it takes time, because at first you're not going to have anything to compare the event with. So you're not going to know whether the, the probably, possibly narcissistic individual is all in their own head and it's all about them because they will have rationalized absolutely everything they say and do to be good, great, and beautiful. And it is not. It is predicated so that they don't have to grow, they don't have to change, they don't have to look at themselves because looking at themselves scares them shitless scares them nearly to death. It's such a deep fear that it is primal for someone who's truly a narcissist. It's a primal fear. They cannot look at their own behavior in case it is found wanting. And it is, many cases, is wanting in huge ways, but they will deflect all blame from themselves. And if you're one of the people they're deflecting it onto by any behaviors, oh, viewers, you need to protect yourself from that. You absolutely do. And if you're a very sensitive person and want to help people and make them feel good and make the atmosphere around you and other persons conducive to growth and help, then you need more boundaries than the average person. And you're the one who's got to set them because there is no way on this good green earth that the narcissist, narcissist is gonna set boundaries, except for what's useful to the narcissist. And they are also, if it's possible, are not going to allow you to set any boundaries. So for persons who are a bit extroverted, that can be very, very difficult as to how to set the boundaries. For those of us who are a little more naturally clinically introverted, because we look inside first, it's a little easier for us to go, whoa, I need to protect myself from that. I think I'll, as I've told you before, you know, dealing with a colleague, you know, the, the one thing you don't want to do is open yourself up to this person and that's what they're going to try to get you to do. But if you, if you open up to that person, your full self and give to them, they are going to use it now or in the future to stab you in the back or pull the rug out from under you because that's how all narcissists all narcissists work. For some of them, it's a game. They don't even know they're playing. But they're always competitive in a particular way, and they're always jealous of any kind of perceived or real. It could be either one. 
uh, attention that is other people. They need to, in one way or another, in their own hearts and mind, feel that they are the most important person in the room. In their own minds, they're the most important person. They're the only person. They are narcissists looking at their own reflection. And if you're not willing to mirror to them what they see of themselves, then you must be done away with psychologically in one way or another. So maybe we will talk about this again. But I hope that helps for now with all the fields in case you suspect that you might be dealing with a friend, colleague, or family member who really is a narcissist and you might not be able to get out of the situation. So thank you so much for being with me at All The Feels. I'm Patricia Angelin of All The Technique. Where is the turn camera around? There it is. <laughs>